is a member of the Saugus River Watershed Council for over 30 years. And she'll talk about the history of the Saugus River. And she's a resident of Lynn and still lives in the house where she grew up located on the banks of the Saugus River. And I have no idea how Masha got a hold of you, but I think it's wonderful that she did. Am I? Is, okay, hold on. We're getting ready here. It's, it's up to you, however you want to do it. Okay. I'm ready. That's Go it? Ahead. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy Wren, uh, as you just heard. And um, yes, I grew up on the Saugus River. And the way that Marsha knows me is that her son owns the house next door to us. And uh, so um, we're, we're both river people. Um, all right, the history of the, so welcome to the history of the Saugus River. Uh, the Saugus River is first mentioned in a public document when in 1621, Governor Endicott grants all of the land between the river at Saugus and the Charles River to one John Donnell. In 1630, John Winthrop lands in Salem with 11 ships and over a thousand immigrants. Well, James well, you're going to have to turn that off, buddy. James did it. He Can you hear ended me? Ended up with three hotels in Monopoly and beat me badly. Okay, Dad. Can, Can everybody, everybody needs to mute? Mute, mute their screen. Mute us. Mute it. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Everybody, yes. mute. Okay. Um. Go ahead. So I was. Uh, we're talking about the, immig the immigration from England of all the Puritans who came over um, and uh, they dispersed from Salem. Some of them Okay. Can did you just hear everything did you she hear said? What, did you hear me? Hello? Oh, that, was, that was me. Obviously, my, my finger was going too fast on my mute, and I was mute, muted you, Kathy. Can you repeat? Yes. OK. I think from here, Mom. What? From here, from here yes. OK. I was talking about uh, this area. Uh, in 1630, John Winthrop landed in Salem with 11 ships and over a thousand uh, passengers. Some of them settled in this area at, at the river at Saugus. And eventually the whole area became known as Saugus. Do I, okay. Uh, the next slide shows a uh, map of Lynn that was uh, found in um, a book by Alonzo Lewis. He wrote the history of Lynn and he wrote it in 1844. However, this uh, map is uh, much earlier than that. I was not able to pinpoint exactly um, when it was um, made, but I like the simplicity of it because you can really see the river. And it's that black squiggly line <laughs> that goes right up through the center of Saugus and past the ironworks. Um, this only mentions a few uh, major places. Um, and we'll hear more about that squiggly line in a, in a little bit. Um, at one time, the whole area was named Saugus, as I said, which was the Native American word for extended. Uh, in the beginning, 
Saugus was comprised of the land now known as Lynn, Swampscott, Lynnfield, Redding, Wakefield, and Nahant. That whole area was originally called Saugus. Um, in 1637, however, the Indian name of Saugus is changed to Lynn after King's Lynn in England. And I believe uh, it was because the regent or the mayor of King's Lynn came to um, this area at that time and they wanted to honor him. Um, actually, uh, a few years ago, about 30 years ago, the Lynn Historical Society invited the mayor of King's Lynn to come for one of our uh, uh, celebrations. And he did with his sash and his, uh, uh, he carries a big long pole, you know, and very, very pleasant time was had with him. Uh, the Saugus River also was a, a Native American name. Uh, and I want to just take a minute to say that I'm very sorry, I do not have a lot of information on the history before the settling of the white man because I just have not been able to find that much, but we do know that for thousands of years, uh, since probably the last ice age, um, the banks of the Saugus River were home to many different um, tribes. Uh, the Pawtuckets are mentioned, Algonquins are mentioned, uh, the um, uh, Sagamore, of course, and uh, but I don't I don't have a lot of information about that. Um, but they did name the Saugus River Abuset. And it is uh, means winding stream. And as you see, it is a winding stream. Uh, before we start the trip down the history of the Saugus River, let me explain a little bit about the Saugus River watershed. As you can see, it, it, it's uh, this whole area. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll try to explain to you what a watershed is if you're if, uh, uh, wondering. Um, it's like a bowl and the, the river runs at the bottom of the bowl. And it's the concept of a watershed revolves around the premise that water runs downhill. So that uh, all of the area in this map all um, drainage goes towards the Saugus River. Uh, there are 11 towns that feed the Saugus River, although the river itself, the, the channel of the river only goes through five of them. Um, and you can see what they are. Um, the Saugus River is uh, 13 miles long and it goes through the five communities. The headwaters of the Saugus River are in Wakefield and they start at Lake Quantapowit. And Lake, it's the source of the Saugus River. It's a glacial kettle pond with 247 surface, surface acres. It, it was probably a much larger lake 8,000 years ago when it was first formed. Um, it was originally called Redding Lake uh, as it borders the uh, southern border of Reading. Um, but it was in 1847, it was renamed in honor of the signer of the eight, 1686 deed. Now I'm making some assumptions here because I couldn't find out any more about that. I'm assuming that Quantapow, it must have been a Native American who signed some kind of a deed. And, um, and that's where the name Lake Quantapow, it came from. Uh, for years, Lake Quantapow was a source of ice for hotels, breweries, and meat packers. The last ice house burned in 1929, and then it became a nice spot for homes. Um, the friends of Lake Quantapow saved a parcel of land that I, uh, on the northern um, edge of the pond that had uh, had a restaurant. I forget the name of it. Some of you maybe remember. And um, they, they were able to save that as a public park. It has a beautiful view of the lake and they named it for Girl Troops Balding, uh, who was a very instrumental in um, 
forming the group called Friends of Lake Quantapowit. And it's a, as you know, many of you probably know, Lake Quantapowit is a very popular spot for people walking. They walk the perimeter of the, of the lake. Um, rather than use a photograph, I decided to use a painting. This is owned by the Wakefield Library. And it is a beautiful painting of like a sunny morning on Lake Quantapowit. It was by Henry Cheva Pratt. Um, he uh, moved to Wakefield in 1860 and he was quite an accomplished artist. Uh, one of his friends was Thomas Cole, the famous uh, Hudson River School painter. And the next slide shows another painter a, a, a Wakefield painter, um, less schooled. He was a, a house painter, self-taught by the name of Franklin Poole. And uh, this is another painting of Lake Wanapowit. And uh, it, you can see that uh, there's an excursion boat in the painting. They used to take people for rides on the pond, on the lake. Um, I love this picture, uh, self-portrait by him, because he 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 takes a a Renaissance pose uh, picture, even with the window in the backdrop and uh, the tools of his trade are on the little table. If you can make those out, and you'll see some more paintings by him later on. Um, another uh, aspect, and this is uh, actually there were a lot of photographs, but I chose this one. Um, of the boathouse at Wakefield. Um, it was sometimes, I, I think it had two names, unless there were two boathouses. I haven't clarified that, but this, this one says Wiley's boathouse. I also saw some paint photos with Ronson's boathouse. Um, and of course the sailing fleet on the, uh, in front of it. Uh, they, they say that it was the oldest continuously operated inland boathouse in the United States. I'm not sure if that's true, but I read that somewhere. Um, the boathouse also uh, featured a dance hall that was very popular. And some of you may have gone there. I did when I was in high school in 1956. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just a charming, wonderful place to go. Um, there are so many activities that people enjoy on the lake, uh, of course, swimming, sailing, and windsurfing in particular, because the lake is known for having a wind pocket and it's much safer than being windsurfing down on uh, Lynn Beach, for instance. So, um, and I mentioned the ice business that was conducted. There were other um, uh, uh, companies and uh, places of business around the lake, um, but I'm not, I did not go into detail on those. Um, I know there was a gas company and that that has caused some problems with the water in the lake, but um, in general, it's a very residential, as you know, area and quite lovely. Uh, at the northern end of the lake is a little culvert and standing next to it, is a fellow member of the Saugus River Watershed Council, Dick Lynch. And this is the start of the Saugus River. This is where it all begins, as you can read there. It's um, 13 miles, falls 90 feet in 13 miles. So it's not a steep, there's no big waterfalls on the Saugus River. Um, from here, the stream that is formed uh, goes under, this street here, uh, it passes under Route 128, heading north, where it enters that great inland freshwater marsh in Linfield, known as Reedy Meadow. And the, this is a lovely picture of uh, one of the duck houses at Reedy Meadow. Uh, formerly known as Linfield Marsh, Reedy Meadow is the largest freshwater cattail marsh in Massachusetts. It is located in the towns of Linfield and Wakefield, and it does touch on Southern Reading at one end, I believe. Um, it's uh, a major water retention area for the Saugus River watershed, as well as a natural wildlife refuge. And um, you probably 
you probably know that it's um, also bordered now by uh, marketplace. <laughs> um, but uh, it does it is a large natural area. Um, Reedy Meadow provides a lot of uh, needed habitat in an urban area. Uh, it's home to fox, river otter, muskrat, beaver, and many species of birds. It's a wonderful place to take a hike. And there is actually a, um, I think it's called Partridge Island Walk that goes into the, the um, meadow. And, um, and it's a good place to go bird watching. Um, the Department of the Interior has designated Reedy, Reedy Meadow as a national, um, national natural landmark. Excuse me for just a minute. I'm getting a, oh, okay, I missed a part. Um, the, the, uh, the uses of the, the, first of all, the name of Reedy Meadow was because of the um, reeds that grow there, the many reeds, and they were very useful for, you know, making baskets, uh, probably stuffing mattresses during the colonial period. Uh, it was also used as a cranberry bog at one time, and uh, also peat and bog were um, harvested there before coal became popular. Okay, on to the next one. Uh, the river, when it goes into Reedy Meadow, it really loses its channel. It, it, it kind of disperses into the whole entire uh, area, but it does maintain a flow that, that wants to work its way out. And it does that at the northern end of the Reedy Meadow. The river um, starts to want to turn uh, south. It's like a large arc and uh, head towards the ocean. And where it does that, there is a dam and it's called, um, the river passes over a dam and it was built in 1893 by the city of Lynn um, to provide water for the city of Lynn. And this was over the protests of the Wakefield Water Company, but the, um, the city prevailed and we have gotten our drinking water, drinking 90% of our drinking water comes from this source. Um, the, the city is allowed to take 12.5 million gallons of water per day to divert to, divert to the Lynn Reservoirs at certain times of the year, uh, mainly in the spring when there's a, a heavier water flow. At, they used to take it all the time, but um, there have been some restrictions made because of the um, effect that it has on the river uh, to take all the water. Uh, but for this, the Lynn Water and Sewer Company, um, the water that goes, to, that's important to them is the water that comes to Lynn. The water that goes over the uh, dam and forms the Saugus River is not as important to them. And I found that out because from its earliest days, they always referred to that part of the dam as the waste dam, the waste gate which uh, of course raises the hackles of all us ecologists. But um, anyway, it, it, um, it's there and um, it, I'll show you the diversion of the water can cause several flow problems as consistent flow is needed by fish and eels that need to migrate up the river to spawn. And if you've been reading the picture here, it talks about the eel ladder that was created in 2009. Uh, we were very, that by the uh, Massachusetts Fisheries, Wildlife and Fisheries Department, with the help of the Saugus River Watershed Council. And we have been doing fish counts on that dam since 2009. And it's one of the longest fish consistent eel counts in the country. Um, let's see. And they are called glass eels. And it's very interesting. It would be nice if there was a fish ladder there too, because of course the dams, the dam uh, prevented alewives from uh, coming up the river and salmon, which in the early days of the river, uh, the Native Americans definitely uh, fished for salmon uh, in the Saugus River. Uh, the photo on the left here says Lindam below the quote unquote waste gate. And this is showing 
how little water, and this was, luckily this was taken several years ago. Um, it's usually sustained a little better now with a little bit more water flow, but that's how low it can get in bad, bad uh, seasons, like in August when there's not much rain. Um, and sometimes it is just a trickle. On the right is where the, the water is heading towards Lynn. That's called the Hawks Diversion because the uh, water, the wastegate the, that they call it is closed and then the water is diverted in a channel that runs, oh, I'm not good, but probably the length of a football field. And it's just below Marketplace actually, looks like a little pond, but it's the beginning of this diversion, which um, has takes a trip. It goes back under Route 128, uh, over, uh, across Salem Street. And at some point it's diverted uh, under Walnut Street into Hawks Pond. Um, and from there, it, um, it flows into a chain of reservoirs until it reaches the Lynn treatment plant. Now, going back to the river, the course of the river, the river itself heads over the dam and straight towards 128. Heading south, it goes under 128, under Salem Street, and then it, under Water Street, and into North Saugus, what is now known North Saugus. And it, um, it became a, a source of many mills. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit about mills with the Saugus River. Uh, this first one, uh, I'm going to tell you about the beginning of it, but I believe this picture is probably of a later mill because the uh, first one was erected, the first dam was erected and mill built by John Gifford, who you will learn about more later on. Uh, he was the second in 1666, uh, he was the second agent for the Saugus Iron Works. He had a falling out with the owners and so he quit and moved into North Saugus to start his own ironworks. And this is the site of the dam. I don't know that this is the actual dam he built, but this is the exact site of the dam. And he bought 171 acres and built a dam, which unfortunately the dam flooded the farm of Adam Hawks, who owned most of North Saugus at that time. And, um, he was sued by Hawks. Hmm? Oh, okay. Um, he, who sued for damages. Well, Gifford had to pay a fine in wood and hay, and he had to agree to keep the water level above the dam at least one and a half feet below the top of the Great Rock. And in this picture to the right, you have The Great Rock by Franklin Poole, who saw it, painting you saw earlier. And this is also a picture, uh, uh, there's another picture of a lumber mill. And I was not really able to identify exactly where that lumber mill was. There were so many lumber mills on the Saugus River over uh, the period of time. Uh, so, um, but the, for instance, it could have been here because the site of the site of this particular mill uh, lasted through the next 200 years. And um, for most of the 17th century, it was, a, it was a lumber mill. Now, in this picture, which is a postcard, I want you to look in the foreground of the, um, pond at the at above the dam and I think you will see a rock sticking up out of the water and I believe that that is the great rock um, if the water was released in the dam and the and the pond was reduced it would be a much bigger rock than what it looks like but it looks to me like it's about a foot and a half 
uh, <laughs> in, uh, by law. So getting back to John Gifford, uh, his mill was not a success. And throughout the 1700s, as I say, the, the, the area was pretty much a sawmill. But in 1811, the property was bought by the Lynn Wire and Screw Company. Uh, they erected a new mill building. And I believe this is the new mill building. Uh, it prospered during the War of 1812, but after the war ended, the business went downhill. And uh, in 1819, they sold the area to John Clark, who turned it into a snuff mill. And then in 1871, the property was acquired by Philip Hone, who operated it till 1902. And did I miss something here, Amy? Wait a minute. Let me go back. Where's the part? Oh, uh, the yes, the um, the thing that I definitely want to mention is uh, on the postcard going back is uh, the 18 in 1820 James Howlett and his son purchased the mill and continued it and then turned it into a shingle mill as you probably read um, this name has stuck, has stuck with this area this is always referred to as Howlett's mill and Howlett, Howlett's dam no matter who owned it it's, it seems that that in Saugus is Howlett's mill and it came to a um, bad ending in 1907. It collapsed in a storm. And that little insert shows you pretty much what it looks like today. There's, there's a, some stones on either side. And so, and so that is the fate of so many of the uh, in, uh, mills. In fact, I, I think I could say just about all of the mills that were built along. They were all wooden and um, they've all pretty much disappeared what's the only ones left are brick. Uh, but more importantly, this area, which was what we in now what we call break card, was um, this was turned eventually the property was sold to the MDC and turned into Breakart Reservation. Uh, early on, Breakart was known as the 600 acres and used as woodlots with some settlement, especially in the 1870 to 1930s, when wealthy sportsmen uh, had rustic lodges and, and they uh, also made improvements with roads and some plantings. Um, but in 1934, it was sold to the MDC and, uh, and then it took on a new life. Uh, for one thing in the 30s, it was the home of a CCC camp leased by the federal government. Uh, camp Nyan, uh, I believe Camp Nyan's Boy Scout camp, um, I think the building there was probably one of the lodges from one of the wealthy sportsmen, uh, but that also uh, was built. And my husband went to Camp Nyan when he was a boy, uh, as did many boys in the area. Uh, then in 1984, there was a real rebirth in recreational areas. Um, Lake, Lake Pierce is a, a nice place to swim. There are hikes. Uh, there's a, you see the bridge over the Saugus River. Um, the, friend, the Friends of Breakheart group were formed and they have run many activities, hiking, uh, jogging, uh, races, trail races, nature walks. And uh, it's a wonderful spot. If you've never been there, you really should go. It also provides diversity of habitat, habitat to a lot of wildlife. There's a lot of wildlife up there. Uh, these two slides are, one is on the west side of Route 1, one is on the east side of Route 1. From Camp Nyan, where the Hawks Brook joins the river, is uh, the slide to the west, and that is behind the Prince House of Pizza. It actually runs parallel to Route 1 for quite a distance. And you'd never know it riding down Route 1 that in just a matter of less than a mile, you've got a pretty little river running along beside the road. From there, the river crosses from east to west to the side of Route 1. And in this case, it travels under one of the oldest highways in the United States, the Newburyport to Boston Turnpike, which was constructed from 1802 to 1805. 
from there, it meanders down uh, uh, towards Saugus and towards, towards the area of the ironworks. But before it gets there, there, is, uh, there are some other dams that were built along there. And um, this, this is a picture of, of the, la the last of the largest big dams that was built. There were other smaller ones built in that same area. This was uh, the Saugus Dam built in 1906. And it was built to, um, by Pranker, Mr. Pranker, to divert the river to the Pranker and Scott mills that are uh, in Saugus and still standing, some of the buildings. Uh, the lake that was formed by this um, dam was called Lily Pond. And um, I'm going to show you a picture of Lily Pond in a moment. Um, but I will say that this dam was dismantled in the 1950s, 1960s. I have not been able to pinpoint the time, but I guess it took a long time to deal with it. Um, it was uh, supposed to be replaced, but it wasn't. Uh, it was sold, a, a contractor was hired to remove sand and gravel and um, all that was left was a small pond that was called Pranker's Pond. But when this pond, when this dam was functioning, it formed Lily Pond, which was very large and became a very popular playground. Um, it was uh, established in 1906, and as I said, it, it, it was drained, pretty much drained uh, in the 60s. Uh, people came out to enjoy the day. They swam. They, uh, there was a boat rental shop, uh, picnic grounds. Um, it was a lovely spot, and it was used for lots of recreation. In the wintertime, it did produce ice. It was actually a, a ice production from the mid 1800s to the 1930s. And then later it was totally recreational, swimming, boating, skating in, in winter. I can attest to that. I skated on Lily Pond when I was a teenager in the 50s. Um, my brother owned a house just uh, three houses down from there. So we used to go skating quite a bit. And his sons learned to skate on Lily, Lily Pond. There was even camping and of course there was fishing. Um, and this is unfortunately the, um, all that's left of that huge pond. And they named this Pranker's Pond after Pranker who, who uh, built the original big uh, mill. I mean, sorry, dam. Um, it's a lovely spot. This is really, it's small, but it's lovely. and. Um, the river, when it comes uh, past Route 1, from, from Route 1 to this spot is um, a very nice walk. Very, it's, a, it's like a bike trail or a walk uh, that, again, you would never know that you were that close to Route 1. Okay. Uh, the dam that was built in 1906 uh, produced... Uh, power for some of these mills. These are the these are still standing to this day. I'm sure some of you have probably seen them. They are for the most part were woolen mills, worsted mills. Uh, prior to these brick buildings, though, there were wooden smaller dams and wooden uh, mills that produced um, uh, grist mills, chocolate things of that type. And now we do come to the Saga Sign Works. It's just below those buildings that you just saw. Um, there's a bridge there on Bridge Street that crosses from one side of the river to the other. And uh, we have the Saga Sign Works. They were established in 1640 on property owned by Thomas Dexter. Um, in the early days of his property, he was given permission to, well, actually in 1646, he was given permission to erect a fish weir and a uh, crude bridge across the river. Um, but the main, main thing, of course, about this is that the Saga Sign Works were formed. It was a company of 11 investors formed in England. 
um, the land was leased and then bought from Mr. Dexter, although he did maintain a part of the daily life of the foundry. The area became a veritable village called Hammersmith. In addition to foundry workers and smithies, wood had to be procured for charcoal uh, and bog iron had to be obtained for the iron. Uh, actually, there was bog iron in the area, but I'm sure they had to bring in more from elsewhere, just as they had to bring in wood from elsewhere. And that's why that and building homes and barns, uh, wood sawmills were very prevalent along the river. Um, there was a dam and a canal that went to the top, as you can see the big uh, wheel up there, that was an overshot wheel. The water came in from above and, uh, and turned the giant wheel. Uh, the area became a veritable village known as Hammersmith. Um, in addition to the foundry workers and smithies, uh, there were all those other people that were needed. Um, that building still exists. And I, if you have never been to the Saugus Iron Works, uh, you really should go. It's a national park owned by the National Park Service. They take very good care of it and they conduct tours. It's a, it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, this is part of it also. And um, this is important because this is the beginning of the estuary. At this point, the river, the fresh water coming down from Lake Quantapow, it mingles with the tidal river coming up from the ocean. And um, so this enabled, this was a, a, one of the reasons why they picked this spot too, because uh, boats could uh, carry um, materials and supplies up to the um, ironworks, and then they could take the manufactured goods back out to the ocean where they were put on larger ships because only um, at this point, the uh, only flat or shallow draft boats were used. And they also had to take the tides into consideration. And um, this is a picture of the kind of boat that would have been used. It's, uh, as you can see, it's a replica built by the Essex Shipbuilding Museum and um, they were very interested in this and did a wonderful job. Um, I actually had the privilege of riding in it when it, they sailed it from Essex down to the mouth of the Saugus River and at the, at, uh, the landing at Fox Hill Bridge on Route 107, I was able to get on. And uh, this is at uh, the bridge in East Saugus where um, we all had to get out because they had to dismant dismantle the masts in order to take it under the bridge. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience. And it, oh, by the way, it's on, it's on view at the ironworks. They made it to be put at the ironworks. Uh, the ironworks did have a uh, kind of a sketchy life. It was, it was um, successful and then not successful. Um, uh, one thing was they have a lot of lawsuits. You, if you read anything about early colonial history, they were all, somebody was always taking somebody to court for something. Um, when the ironworks dam caused flooding at times over neighboring farms, and when it prevented fish and eels from reaching the upper reaches, especially the people in Reading complained about the lack of alewives coming into uh, Reedy Meadow. Um, in fact, they were so angry that in 1671, some people um, actually came in the night and broke down the dam, a part of the dam, to, to leave, let the water out. Um, there were also um, problems of inadequate capital, uh, difficulties between the managers and the English owners, uh, the lawsuits, uh, the depletion of wood for charcoal and uh, the simple fact that not many people had the cash to buy iron products that the company made. So in any case, it did fold. And in 1683, it was sold and the land reverted to farmland. Now this lumber mill had, 
is across from the ironworks, but it was not in existence at the time of the ironworks. As you can see, it's 1907, uh, but it's quite a large one. And it, it brings to light the fact that so much of the area was denuded uh, for building. Uh, the, 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 uh, the old growth forests were disappearing rapidly. And, um, and of course, the land was cleared for farming as well. Um, this next picture is a picture of Round Hill. And as you can see, it almost has no trees. Uh, this is behind uh, where the uh, Saugus police station is. It, it's almost in downtown Saugus at the center. And uh, when I first started researching this, I decided that I was gonna go up to the top of Round Hill and look out. Well, <laughs> it looked a lot different. It was totally forested. The leaves, the trees were as thick as could be. And I would have had to climb to the top of a tree, which I wasn't about to do to even see anything. But this is the view that I wanted to see. This is a drawing taken from the top, down from the top of Round Hill. And um, it was from a book that was uh, published in uh, 1840 called The Geological Survey of Massachusetts. Uh, Edward Hitchcock, the third president of Amherst conducted that um, survey. And um, he, um, this, this drawing appealed to me because I, I uh, read that um, he took his wife with him on many of the trips to survey and she made drawings. And this has no name on it, but I like to think that it's one of her drawings. I'm not sure. Uh, this is another view of Round Hill, only this is from the river down below, looking back up at it. And way in the back, I think you can see, it looks like uh, Moscow, but it's, it's the Saugus Town Hall, uh, just, just peeking up above there. And of course, you would never see that from the river today because all the trees would be in the way. This is another view. This was a very scenic part of the river. And this is the windy part of the river. Um, this is um, looking east from Round Hill. And remember, Abuset means winding river. And if you'll bear with me, I will read you the legend of how the Saugus River came to be. According to Indian legend, the great spirit saw an enormous serpent basking in the sun among the boulders. Picking one up, he hurled it at the monster, but missed him, and the serpent started with great speed for the ocean. Using all his cunning, the reptile slithered right and left, sometimes dodged back between the legs of his pursuer. He reached the sea, but because the earth was still soft at that time, the tortuous channel of the Saugus River was formed. That's from a book by uh, Newhall. Hmm? The serpent's body sank. <laughs> oh, and that's the body serpent's body sank yes. somewhat and thus was yes. plunged the tortuous channel of the Saugus River. I missed the line. On this section of the river, as you could see in that last postcard, people love to um, canoe. In fact, Saugus had a, um, a, a Saugus canoe and tennis club, and it was on the banks of the Saugus River up on Central Street. Um, Indian canoes were popular for recreation, even in the early periods when there wasn't too much time to actually rec recreate. Uh, to the right is a picture of a Saugus River Watershed Council sponsored canoe uh, that we ran those for several years. Unfortunately, uh, the man who ran them um, was no longer able to and um, so we, we really had to disband them for, we're hope, we hope someday to get them going again, but people, they were very popular. People signed up for them. Um, and further down, uh, actually uh, this ties into the canoes too. Um, this is the Soccer Brookyard established in 1842, very fine clay. Uh, it lasted for many years. Um, this, I, when I was a kid, 
Um, this was a pansy farm on the banks of the river. Uh, the, Stalker fam um, the Stalker family donated the land, four acres, uh, for a playground. And today in this area, is there's a lovely little uh, public playground with a small dock to put in a canoe. At the end of this uh, winding section, um, we come to the city of Lynn. And um, this is a view of East Saugus, the bridge at East Saugus. It's the, actually the site of one of the oldest real bridges in this country, I believe, because it was built in 1639 originally. Uh, this bridge, of course, that you're looking at was not that bridge. And this one, I think, was built in the uh, 1920s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this was to facilitate travel and shorten the distance from Boston to Salem. Um, during the colonial period, that's how people went from Salem to Boston. This was I had various names, uh, the old highway, the, my father and mother always referred to it as the Boston Post Road. Um, the general court donated uh, 50 pounds to have a bridge built across, and it was called the Great Bridge. Um, the allowance of 50 shillings a year uh, was paid to maintain the bridge. And it was the most used road until 1803 when the Salem to Boston Turnpike, the Salem Turnpike was built, which is Route 107. This is a view of East Boston to the East Saugus. <clears throat> East Saugus, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, view of East Saugus. And uh, to the left is the uh, old Boston Road. Today it's known as Lincoln Avenue. Um, <clears throat> it was, this was the site of many tidal mills. As you can see, the, the water was narrowed down there where the bridge was. And so the flow of the tide was quite strong. Um, there were such mills as uh, grain, corn, snuff, chocolate, uh, during the Civil War, it was coffee. Um, the list of people who owned mills is too long, uh, but there was, uh, Sweetser was one name and Childs was uh, one name and they manufactured chocolate. And I'm not sure if they're the Childs that went on to be a chocolate place in Boston or not, but I'm gonna look into that someday. Oh, I forgot to mention, you, you saw for yourself the names of the people. You probably wondered. Oh, they, yes, Benedict Arnold, traveling north with his troops, watch, marched up this road. General Washington in 1792 stopped at the Old Anchor Tavern, which was up the road a piece and, uh, and had a lunch. It was a very popular spot because it was, this was about halfway between Boston and Salem. Uh, General Lafayette uh, traveled it when he came back uh, to, uh, to be applauded. And uh, there were arches of flowers placed over the road to honor him. Um, this next picture, the Masonic Hall, um, is interesting because it's one of the few buildings that actually exists today and if I'd had time, I would have put a picture of what it looks like today because about four years ago, it was turned into condos. And, uh, but the basic size and shape of it has um, it, it been maintained. So I guess better than tearing it down completely. And, uh, and that's uh, a nice spot. But as I said, with the mills all along the river, as soon as if a mill burnt down, somebody else built it up, better, newer. Uh, this kind of thing has been going on for a very long time. On the other side of the bridge, looking east now, we're heading really towards the ocean is a little area we call Saugus Harbor. Um, uh, we're actually, uh, if you look up in the upper left-hand corner, you can just barely make out uh, smokestacks from the General Electric building. 
uh, which was completed by 1893. And now we move down the river towards Lynn. I love these two pictures. The left is, uh, this is the um, bed of the old East Saugus Branch Railroad that was established in 1844. Uh, it actually didn't run any cars until 1854. And it came from um, Everett through Malden, Revere, Saugus, and Lynn. Um, and you can see that in the left picture, um, I don't know if you can make out, it's actually still, it's just an old um, path. But in the right is a beautiful new bike trail. In the last four years, the state of Massachusetts has built this beautiful bike trail from Everett to Lynn. It originally was called Bike to the Sea, but now it's called the Northern Strand Bike Trail. Uh, and eventually someday they hope to um, extend it across the uh, Mystic River so that we, people can go all the way to Boston. Uh, we've spent a lot of time on that the last couple of years. People were, have been walking it as, uh, tremendously during the COVID crisis. At the, um, if you knew where to look in that last picture, you uh, would see the locale. This is uh, where the river turns and heads uh, due east uh, down from Saugus the Saugus River Yacht Club. When I was a kid, this was still there. I don't remember exactly when it burned, but I think I was like a young teenager at the time and it was made quite a fire. But it was a real yacht club. We had beautiful yachts uh, moored out in the river. Um, we lived right on the water and we, as kids, we swam in the river all the time. And we were always swimming out to the, the yachts. You know, I'll beat you to the, Hopkins boat or whatever is what we'd say. This is at the end of Dearborn Avenue. And if you'll indulge me for a few seconds here, I, uh, this is my father. <laughs> my, my maiden name was Tewksbury and uh, he, this is my brother and my sister, my oldest brother and my sister. And uh, the, the main reason we live on the river is that my father loved the water. He grew up in Winthrop and he went to a Massachusetts Maritime Academy and he was in the Navy. And when he and got a job at the GE, he was a draftsman uh, in 1927. Uh, he and my mother went looking for a house and uh, my mother said, once he saw this one, there was no going back. Uh, at the time, there was this fish club in the back, and um, it didn't actually go with the property, <laughs> um, but men in the neighborhood used it. Uh, they were private clubs, um, and this one was called the Owl. And in the Depression, my, it was gone. It was no longer used. It was falling apart, and my, my father tore it, tore it down because he had to pay taxes on it, even though he didn't really own it. So I don't know, go figure. Um, further down the street is another fish uh, uh, club. And uh, that one though, at the time this picture was taken was also derelict. Uh, that one came down even later. In the background, you see this cone shape. And uh, I believe that it's a bonfire. And to the left, I have a picture of a bonfire that was up in Saugus and it is made of barrels. They used to stack the barrels to make these huge cones to burn. You can actually see the people in front of the barrels. Oh, <laughs> uh, the same shed that you just saw from the other side uh, is the backdrop for this uh, boat race. Um, and uh, in the late 1850s, Benjamin Newhall called this tree that's across the river, if you can make out that tree, he called it the old eagle tree in a newspaper article because for a period of 20 years, this oak tree was the favorite spot of a very large white-headed eagle, which we must assume is a bald eagle, and who appeared every morning, uh, but the tree was eventually 
blown down in a hurricane or something and he was seen no more. However, we have a pair of bald eagles who have been coming to the location, the Saugus River, uh, for what, maybe about three or four years now? Yeah. yeah, just about three or four years. And guess what? There's another tall tree across the river. And in the morning, they can often be seen sitting in that tree. And a couple of weeks ago, we saw one sitting in the trees across the street from our house. So we're always excited to see the people of eagles. Also, the other birds that have come back are osprey. And there is an osprey nest actually built in, up in Saugus that is used most years. Um, a little further down the river, um, I, I'm a little bit nervous about time. What it, it's 10 did, past. It's been like an hour. I don't know. That doesn't mean anything to me. How long have I been talking? Like an hour. Oh, gosh. Ginny, are you okay with the time or should I wrap it up? You're doing fine. You have been talking probably 40 minutes. Is that all? Oh, okay. You just <laughs> feel like you've been talking forever. Yeah, but no. Yeah. You, you, you are okay. well under an hour. That's, you, okay, let's just the let's just show them the fast. pictures, okay? The next ones are fast. Just just mm -hmm. go ahead. Needham's landing. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm following you. Oh. Oh, I love this picture of the of the lobster fleet. And the next picture, the oil painting by Charles Woodbury, which was probably done in 1887 area. He was a very famous artist. He, has, uh, he was a member of the Lynn Beach Painters. Uh, he graduated, he grew up in Lynn. Uh, he uh, graduated from MIT and they owned some of his works. Uh, there's some of his works at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, and, um, and he's very highly regarded. He was uh, definitely of the American Impressionism period. Um, I ha also had the privilege of driving up to um, Maine uh, with the uh, director of the Lynn Museum several years ago. Uh, this painting was donated to the museum by Charles Woodbury's um, uh, daughter-in-law. Uh, he was one of the um, charter members of the, uh, and one of the founders of the Ogunquit Art Colony. And that's where we went. We went up to his studio in uh, Ogunquit and the uh, daughter-in-law gave us the painting and it's at the Lynn Museum. Very, very, very nice to have that. Uh, another very uh, famous uh, um, area of that part of the river is the Britt Brothers uh, boat builders. Uh, they came from Maine. They built a factory at the end of Reed Street in 1903. Unfortunately, that's, uh, that burnt down. And then they rebuilt across the river at Needham's, at uh, Ballard, Ballard's Landing. They were very famous yacht builders and they worked with the designer hair shop, as it says here. Um, the uh, boat factory at the end of Reed Street burned in June of 1936. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it burned uh, at the night, in the night, the very next, and it, it had at the time a finished yacht that was going to be. Um, uh, put in, put out, you know, into the water the next day. And so that beautiful yacht was burnt up as well as the building. And then they, um, actually, this is the building that burnt. Yeah. But they also, as I said, built over a, a new one. All of their papers and photographs are owned by the Mystic Seaport Museum in Connecticut. And they were featured in an article in Wooden Boat Builder magazine. Um, my brother, who was a lot older than me, said that when he was a kid, he used to deliver newspaper. He was a paper boy and he delivered to one of the Brick Brothers. 
that had a house down the street. My sister said she remembers when it burnt down. And I, uh, I think she was about five years old. And she, I guess it was quite a conflagration. And uh, the neighbors were afraid that the whole neighborhood was going to go up in flames. OK, this next slide, um, I do not have a lot of information for you here, I'm afraid. Uh, this, is a, this was taken at a cleanup at the end of the river, uh, at the end of River Street, which was appropriately named. This was an area. In the background, you can see there was a, um, a car, a Caps Auto Yard, and so on. The reason I, I have it here, though, is that um, in the early 1800s, around 1830 something, um, this area was used to house a fleet of whaling ships, three whaling ships. There was a whaling company formed by Hezekiah Chase and they uh, were going to run it out of the Saugus River. Um, this, there's a street in this its neighborhood called Cooper Street and Cooper Street was named for the barrel maker who made the barrels for whale oil. There was also a, a rope walk. Uh, you know, there were, in other words, it was the whole like mini whaling village in this area. Uh, however, uh, I'm going to bring that up again in a few minutes. This is a, a shot of Fox Hill Bridge, um, as it says part of the turnpike uh, built in uh, 1803. Um, this is the, the part of, that's why the bridge was built in East Saugus where it was. At this part of the river, the tide is too strong and it's also too wide. It was too wide to build something in the 1600s. But here in 1803, they were able, uh, this actual bridge was replaced in 1915 with a, uh, a uh, drawbridge that goes up and down. And that bridge is actually being replaced right now as I speak, uh, the state has been uh, replacing that dra drawbridge with a new drawbridge, but uh, that's not complete yet. Uh, here it is, Route 107, looking towards Boston. It, it goes uh, across, the salt marsh known as Rumney Marsh. Um, the cost of Route 107 was $189,000 and there were 12 shareholders. Uh, it was a toll road until the 12 shareholders recovered their costs plus an interest. Uh, they ended up making about 5% interest on their money. Uh, the the road at this time was required to have turnouts for hay wagons because at this time, uh, the people would, the farmers would um, harvest the hay, the salt marsh hay. And you, those big lumps that you see in the background are uh, haystacks. They were placed up on little wooden stanchions. And I've been told that if you walk out into the marsh, you actually, in some cases, can see the remains of those stanchions. Uh, this was fodder for uh, the horses and cows, I guess. Um, this about 600 acres of estuary owned by the MDC. Rumney Marsh is very valuable piece of property. Unfortunately, it's also been used for garbage dumps and trash dumps and be, before people realized how important marshes are as a, a, a sponge and a buffer against uh, the elements. Um, I also find it interesting that uh, Kings Lynn, which Lynn was named for, uh, was an area in southeastern England, right on the coast. And I looked at a map of it one day, and there was a large marsh area called Romney's Marsh, R-O-M-N-E-Y. And I believe that the early settlers that named it Kings Lynn, probably some of them came from Kings Lynn and named this 
Rumney, Rumney Marsh, but we spell it R-U-M. But I'm not sure about that, but I think it's a pretty good conjecture. Um, okay, now we come to the other side of the bridge and we see the uh, GE, which was the merger of Edison's GE and the Thompson Houston Electric. Um, I mentioned the whaling industry. The uh, wharf that the whaling ships used were actually along this stretch where the GE is. The GE had a wharf too. I'm not sure if they use the same wharf or another wharf was built. Um, of, course, of course, the GE was built on marshland. At that time, as I say, the marshes were considered uh, a waste, barren marshland, and they encouraged the development of marshland. Now, of course, it's protected. Over in the insert, we have what, the GE, Amy? Yeah, that's a bird's eye view of the GE. And uh, in the distance, you might be able to see a bridge. And this is looking back towards, this is a reverse. We're looking back towards, uh, so August is in the distance and we're seeing a bridge from the GE over. And that is a railroad bridge. That was erected in 1838. And that's what really did in the whaling. The, the, the wharf was beyond that area and uh, that made it impossible for the ships to sail into the, to, into the wharf. Um, so uh, it, there was also a depression, I believe at that time. Uh, that and the bridge being built uh, put it into the short-lived whaling village. Uh, the uh, trestle that you see in the foreground, it has a pipe on it now, but I believe those are the uh, trestles that were used for the narrow gauge railway that went from Boston across the harbor uh, through uh, Chelsea Revere and eventually across and down into Lynn. Um, oh, I was pushing the wrong thing. Uh, this is a map of an area called the Pines River. Up at the top, you can see that uh, it comes off of the Saugus River. It's quite a large, it's one of the tributaries of, of the Saugus River. And um, if you take a canoe up into the Pines River, this is the kind of view that you're going to get. It's a very lush, lush marsh and very pretty. Uh, and people do canoe that area. We're getting near the end now, um, as uh, some of you may know, this is the General Edwards Bridge. It goes from Revere to downtown Lynn, what is known as the Lynn Way. It was built in 1932 to 1935. Prior to that, there was a wooden bridge, 1200 feet long, that was built in 1906. In 1921, the wooden bridge, um, burnt down and a miracle of miracles, they were actually to rebuild it temporarily in 13 days How, for a temporary bridge. However, the temporary bridge lasted for 12 years until uh, 1932 when this bridge was built. Um, it's quite a wonderful bridge named after General Clarence Edwards who was a commander of the y Yankee division in World War I. And right to the right of it, we're standing in Revere, is the uh, Point of Pines Yacht Club, if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, this is a view uh, taking towards Lynn, a little further down, probably from the Yacht Club. You can see the, uh, there's a, uh, a docks for fishing, any people fish. Uh, there's actually the remains of some old barges there. And, Beyond that is Lynn Harbor, there's the big gas tank. 
uh, to, the le to the left of the uh, wharf is a large area. Uh, if any of you chopped at building 19, that was the area that that was located. That is uh, slated to be completely redone. Uh, there's going to be housing. There's going to be a, pu a, a public walkway around a harbor walk. There's going to be a, um, a place for uh, entertainment shops. Uh, this is uh, definitely, I've been to several meetings, this is being planned. But we finally come to the end of our journey where the Saugus River meets the, out to the ocean. It, a little bit of Lynn Harbor and to the right, you see the beginning of Revere Beach. Um, the, um, the, area with the beach there is Point of Pines, which uh, was at one time uh, a, a pleasure park. It, it was, um, and there were three big hotels on that. And um, they eventually were torn down. They, we're talking about the 1800s. Um, I don't have any notes on this, Amy. Yeah. Was I supposed to? Nope. Oh, okay. So this takes us to the end of our journey uh, out to the ocean. One of the things that I found very interesting about Point of Pines is, yeah, um, that, you know, it, it's, uh, it's an area where the people who live there actually own the beach. Uh, and uh, they were able to purchase that beach for $8,000 way, way, way back. Uh, the, the, um, the man that owned the hotels that owned a, the large area of it left the hotel, the, left it to his secretary and his secretary sold it to the uh, Point of Pines uh, Housing Association. Uh, so it's essentially a private beach, although you can certainly walk on it. Okay, and finally, we have a lovely sunset view. Now this is back, this is taken from my backyard, looking towards Saugus, as you can see, looking due west. There's a few boats still out in the water there. And uh, the pilings are the remains of a, uh, uh, a wall that my neighbor had uh, built many, many, many years ago that has long since deteriorated. But it's a beautiful photograph and we do have gorgeous sunsets, um, in the, especially in the summer. Um, so this brings us to the end of our journey, right? Last, last slide. And I hope that I haven't taken too long, but uh, there was even more that I could have told you. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful um, journey, and I, uh, I, I love taking it. I hope you did, too. Thank I thought you. it was fascinating. I, I still got you all muted, because otherwise we'll hear all sorts of strange things. But, Kathy, it was fascinating. You, you and Amy did an awful lot of work to get this all together. I have no idea if the recording actually worked or what it recorded, but I'll, I'll let you guys know. We do have a couple questions. That island, Scott Stimson, Stimson came up with some really good ones. He obviously knows everything. All right, let me uh, uh, un, 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 unmute him. Okay, so. Um, he is would, Bonnie Island. Is I'm looking name. at them, okay. <laughs> oh, so, I'm sorry, I made comments as you did your whole talk. So you yeah, asked the yeah. name of the restaurant at the head of the Lonnie, lake. Uh, what about uh, Lonnie Island? How do you pronounce that? Lonnie Island. Lonnie Island, that's yeah. what it was, I yes. It was that, quite yeah. a drinking place. Yeah, okay, and does, uh, uh, okay, the, the city of Lynn pumps their water out of the Lynnfield location, yes. Uh, I, I, w way back up in the um, Reedy Meadow then, huh? Well, I'll tell you what, you know the hotel, you know the big hotel on the yeah, edge of Reedy sure. Meadow? Okay, yep. I think it's a Marriott, right? Yeah, uh, if, uh, if, it was a Skywood or whatever they called it. I can't, I think it is. Yeah. But anyway, if you go to that hotel mm -hmm. and you drive down below it into mm -hmm. their parking lot and get yeah. out and walk towards the river, 
you will see the Lynn Dam. That's where the Lynn Dam is, right near the hotel. You know, and you will you will also see the Hawks Diversion. Yeah, I was wondering because seeing the river where the Saugus Iron Works is, at least in the summertime, I think, how did they ever power anything with this river? But it sounds like a good deal of the water is now diverted. Uh, and yeah, dredging. Yeah, there's less. Um, but of course, the thing about it is, at the at the time that those early mills were built, the Lynn Dam wasn't there. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so. And as you saw, Howlett's Mill and all the different mills, they were dammed. Yeah. So that's how they, you know, use them. Um, the uh, the Lynn, Lynn water sewer treatment also gets about 10% of their water from the Ipswich River. And um, they, they really have to kind of toe the mark now about not taking too much water. Yeah. Um, but it's very good water, you know. It's very good water. It gets very highly rated, and it's when it's tested. Uh, any other? Oh, the herrings. I really did not deal that much with the herrings, but the herrings, the alewives, were extremely important in the early days, the colonial period especially. And they talk about the the the, the uh, alewives coming up. I remember even as a young teenager, uh, there was a a section where a stream came down out of Lynn Woods into the Saugus River. And you could go in the spring and practically walk across the stream on the backs of the Elwives. Yes. And I read an account by a Saugus man who said as a boy, they used to go and catch the Elwives with their hands mm. in, in those streams, but not in, um, but of course, Jam, that's why there were so many lawsuits because the dams would keep the ale the ale was needed to needed they 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 couldn't jump over they couldn't jump over the the, the dams so, but there were and they st there were actually are still some herring in the river uh, we have a lot of bass on the river people love to go bass fishing and some and you see the bass they, they're going after the the herring it, okay, is there another question here that I don't know? Something about the bricks that built Lynn? Oh, uh, she was talking about the brickyard uh, there in Saugust. And um, many of those bricks ended up in the buildings in downtown Lynn, the yellowish bricks, I think, in the mm. yellow buildings. I would imagine so. Yeah, well, I think that's the reason the brick lot yard was located where it was, because Lynn was yeah. such a growing industrial mm. city and they needed bricks. Mm-hmm. So the buildings mm -hmm. in downtown Lynn, the ones that are the older buildings with the yellowish bricks, those were the bricks mm -hmm. that came out of the, mm -hmm. um, the brickyard there, I think. All right. This is one of the things I like about giving the talk. I always learn things as well as <laughs> tell things. Yeah. Um, I know one man at one of the talks I gave um, several years ago, I was asked by the Lynn Historical Society to do it the first time. That was over <clears> 20 years ago. Um, but one of the men told me about as a boy up in Saugus, he uh, would go swimming in the river and diving for uh, freshwater pearls, which was news to me. I had, I had no idea that, that he had that kind of thing. So, okay. Um, Amy, how do I make this move so I can see more? Actually, I think, I think we have another. Is there another one? I think Lee Atlas is waving his hand. I okay. think he can. can you all unmute? There we yes, go. can you hear me? Yes. What is uh, it? Thank you. Three quick questions. One is, oh, is there an echo? Is that, is that um, somebody's, there we go, that stopped. Yes, we had an echo, yes. That was from you. How about now, is it okay? No. You know what? I know what it is. What is it? Is a phone and computer going at the same time? Why don't you text us the, your question, Lee, and we'll answer it. It's because you are you connected both from the phone and the and the um you in you in it twice. You just mute your computer and talk on your phone if you have your phone going. 
How about now? That's good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear no. you. Go for it, Lee. Go ahead. I can't hear them. Then you can ask your question and then quickly. All right. All right. Except now he can he can't hear us. All right. How come I can't hear? Um, if you can hear me, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, one thing was you mentioned Round Hill. Was mm -hmm. that the center of Saugus, and is that hill still there? Yes. Yes. It's near Saugus Center, very near Saugus Center. It's behind the uh, police station on okay. uh, Hamilton Avenue, and it is definitely still there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, you remember, where, can you tell me where we could go to still see if those eagles are in the tree? Is it, do they frequent it now? The eagle you mentioned? Uh, yeah. I can, well, I, we the first place, the, the first time we noticed the eagles was within the last two years when we started walking uh, uh, the bike trail, uh, because, you know, to get outdoors and get some fresh air. We started noticing them flying over the bike trail and over that uh, East Saugus section. But we also see the, a little further up the river towards us, across right across from us, as I said, there is a tree, a large tree. At, at the end of not that same tree, but another one. At the end of Houston Avenue. It's at the Houston, end of Houston Avenue. In Saugus. In Saugus. And my daughter Amy says she she's become quite a birder and she looks out every morning. You said you see it quite often. Yeah, right? but I haven't seen him in about four days. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. There's a there's a pair of them. And uh, someone from the Bike to the Sea Trail group uh, took some beautiful pictures of them um, uh, last year. And they, they tend to hang out in that tree in the morning, and then they tend to be in the sort of open marshy area behind the Saugus River Yacht Club in the evenings mm -hmm. or in, in the sort of the crossroads section uh, over by the bridge in Saugus sometimes. They're really huge when the, the wingspan is quite large, bigger than the osprey. And now I have seen osprey diving into the river catching fish. I haven't seen the eagle do that yet, but I suppose they do. Last question is, is there any way if I had a canoe or a little boat, I could, I could kind of do trail, go along the river and, mm -hmm. and mimic what you just demonstrated for us mm -hmm. today? Like to do a trip. Well, I can't answer that exactly, Lee, but I would, the first place I would check out is the Stalker Playground. Now, the Stalker Playground is uh, off of uh, Winter Street, and Winter Street runs between Central Street and um, Chest Chestnut Street. It, it parallels the Saugus River. So if you went into Saugus center and uh, went uh, up to Winter Street. Uh, the other thing that's on Winter Street is the cemetery. So anybody could point you to it. Uh, you go past the cemetery and you keep your eye on, I don't know what the name of the street is, but you keep your eye on the left and you will see uh, it's a little, they're all little dead end, they're dead end streets that go down to the river's edge. And one of them is, I don't know if it's called Stalker or not, but it goes, I think there's a sign for Stalker Playground. And that, that has a little um, uh, dock. Um, and then uh, if, you want to, if you want to give me your uh, information or give Jenny your information, she can give it to me. Uh, I could maybe look into it because it, uh, it might be possible to put in it on Ballard Street or at the Point of Pines Yacht Club or even down at the end of my street where the Saugus River uh, Yacht Club was. There, there's a little uh, beach there and uh, you'd be able to park and uh, put a, put a it's, it's a canoe you can carry, you know, you could put I, in there. I, I can give you some advice on that if you'd like. Hmm? What do you say? Oh. Me. Whoops. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Uh, yes, I will. I, Lee, I will. I will give Kathy your email address. Okay, I think I, I might have lost him because I don't see mm -hmm. him. I don't see him face okay. here. Okay, does anybody else have anything? Was there any other questions? Nobody's well, writing just, anything down. I just wanted to say what an excellent talk it was. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. It really was. Um, we've had we've had some very interesting talks over the years, but this is great. It's great fun to hear about. We we forget that we were North Reading was such an important part of the of the of the early settlement of Lynn. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were here. We were uh, out at the furthest most edge of of what was known as Lynn. And it's wonderful to hear about our early uh, um, uh, uh, how how we were also interconnected by waterways in our early days. Right, right. Well, um, I also, um, oh gosh, I had a thought in my head and it just went. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that awful when that happens? Oh, what was it about? Something, what were you talking, what was this topic? What were you talking? The, uh, about the importance of North Reading and- or Oh, Reading oh yes. And, and what I didn't, I didn't um, actually state, I said, I said that the area was known as Saugus for a long time, but then it was changed to Lynn. But then eventually everybody broke off, especially in the early 1800s, when you'll notice as you ride around this area, the signs are all established. Uh, like Saugus was established as Saugus uh, in 1812. I think Linfield broke off from Lynn in 1824. Uh, part, you know, they were known as a parish and part of it had to do with distance from the meeting house and how many people you had in your, if you had a certain number of people in your area, you could then break off from, because it was very long journey to go from Reading or Linfield or Wakefield to Lynn on Sunday by horse and wagon to the, uh, you know, the church, the meeting house. Uh, some of you probably know about that. Um, but uh, all of those, um, one of the things that I, I didn't mention also that I'd like to is um, it, because some areas had different names. If you look at a really early map, you don't see Revere. It's, it's called Winnesimit. And, uh, and Revere and Chelsea were all one at one time, again. And it was around the 1840s and 1850s that there was this, I've noticed that most of the, the towns have uh, you know, separated from whoever was the big, you know, the big town at that time. Right. Well, North Reading separated from Reading in 1853. But yeah, we, had, yeah. we had been a separate, we had been the North Parish since 1720 mm -hmm. and uh, of, of Reading. And then of course, before that, we were, we were just considered to be the farthest outreach of Lynn. Yes, right, right. Mm-hmm. So that I didn't, I actually didn't mention that, but that that's an important. So there is, there was a linkage, you know. People said to me, "Why are you doing the talk in North Reading?" <laughs> I said, "Well, they're interested." <laughs> and uh, I I do find yes, the colonial period. You know, I went out to take some photographs. Those photographs of East Saugus Bridge I took. Was it yesterday that was such a beautiful day, with bright sun and not too cold? And I was taking a picture of a park that's right up next to the bridge in Lynn called Marshview Park. It was put in about, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago or so. It was going to be a, uh, it was going to be a Dunkin' Donuts and, and the Saugus River watershed. We really fought against it. And our representative went to town and did a really good job and saved it. And the land was given or sold to the MDC and they put in this really lovely park with a gazebo that you can sit and look down at the marsh and the river and there was a man there and I went to take a photograph and he went to get up and leave the gazebo and I said oh you don't have to leave I said I, I can take it he said no no you don't want me in it and he came over and he was asking me what I was doing and it turns out that he was from Arizona and he said you know I'm from Arizona but 
he said, I, uh, I'm up here. He said, my mother died a while ago and her people were from this area and I was curious and I love history. And he was just fascinated. I was telling him about the rail trail and you know the colonial period. Um, there's just so much history in this area. Um, I, I mean, any one of these topics you could do a whole hour on. You could do a whole hour on the Yanka Tavern and who went there and who oh, yes. owned it and changed names and so on, you know? Uh, it's uh, uh, that whole Stalker Dam, uh, Pranker Pond, Lily Pond area. Uh, I, I mentioned that my brother's uh, uh, sons learned to uh, skate on Lily Pond and play hockey. And it paid off because one of them, his oldest son, ended up going to Yale on a hockey scholarship. <laughs> so, and his youngest son went on a hockey scholarship <laughs> so, uh, to Yale. So uh, that, was, uh, that was, you know, very relevant to our family. Uh, well, thank you, Kathy. Is there anything else? Dead silence. I was just going to say that we're lucky to still have the Saugus Ironworks because I, if I remember correctly, uh, Henry Ford wanted to carry the Iron Master's house off to Deerfield, off to his village oh. there. And, uh... mm -hmm. <laughs> that, yes, that's a beautiful, and as I said, if you haven't been there, you should go. And the other interesting thing about that that I didn't mention um, about the mills. Uh, just above the uh, Saga Signworks is the uh, Prankers Mills, the Scott Mills, the Worcester Mills. Um, the, the, the mills there, uh, they were finally sold at one point to, um, oh my God, I just had his name and now I've forgotten it. it the, the, the uh, uh, oh dear, the man who uh, you took it during the turn of the century when the, the colonial revival was in, uh, Wallace Nutting. Some of oh, you yeah. probably oh, no. know okay. Wallace Nutting. Yeah, yeah. and his, his drawings. Well, he bought a, a cup of those old brick buildings for his enterprises. And as you probably know, one of his enterprises was he'd take a photograph of an area, it was black and white, and then he had women who would color them in with a colored pencil like. Oh yes, you know, all paint. those, oh, that's right. All those hand colored photographs. Hand, hand colored photographs, yes. He also reproduced colonial furniture in, some, oh, in the factory oh, and yes. sold those. And he did it and he was re instrumental, I think in the Iron Master's house to make sure that it was, um, you know, he also would dress people in colonial garb and, and set them in a colonial setting and take a photograph of them. Mm -hmm. And a little interesting, I find interesting side story to that is, I was talking to an older gentleman in Lynn who was a member of the Friends of Lynn Woods and um, a lot of history there. And um, he said that his grandmother worked for Wallace Nutting as one of those colorists. And those women were taught to sign those prints with Wallace Nutting's name. And they tried to make it look like his handwriting, but they were all a little different. And he said they got to know his grandmother's signature. And so if they looked at a Wallace Nutting print, they always looked to see in the signature if it was one of hers. <laughs> yeah, and I thought that was interesting. Now, the other thing that I left out, because it's a whole story in itself, and it really could take a whole hour to tell it, is the story of the pirates that uh, supposedly came to Lynn, that came to the Saga Cyan Works, and then ended up in Lynn Woods. Lynn Woods itself has a tremendous history, and, and it, it's connected to the Iron Works in some areas. So. So that's uh, another uh, story. Maybe we can do that another time. But I figured it was going to be too long tonight. So. <laughs> anyway. Once you start talking you're... about pirates, it's hard to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Anything else? 
All right. Well, thank you again, thank you. Kathy. Right. See? Thank you for having me. And you, you and, and Amy, my word, you guys spend hours and hours and hours getting this thing prepared. Excellent job. Oh, I could not have done it without her. She is a professional. She is a professional in the publishing profession. And um, so she's much more at home with, um, with, um, uh, you know, computer. And I have been told by my seven year old grandson uh, two weeks ago, I am old school. <laughs> so, and he's right. Yeah, but you know, I, you know, I had all of this on slides. And so we had to scan all the slides and get them into digital form. And then I had to learn this. Uh, I used a uh, program, uh, uh, not, uh, not, not PowerPoint. Uh, my daughter said that one was too difficult for me. She, she got a, a simpler one. So I've learned that, but it took a, it was a long learning curve, you know? But now, so. you know, you're no longer, now I know. you're no longer, yeah. old. you're going to get a new, your own computer though. That's newer probably. Okay. <laughs> and please let me know when you do your next meeting and, uh, and, and maybe I'll try to come to it. Okay. We'll oh, keep great. you on the loop then. Yes. Thank yes. you. Okay. All, All right. right. All right. Well, I guess that will end the meeting. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.